Good evening, everybody. I'm Susie, Susie Lau. I'm one of the other uh, GYN oncologists. And so my task today is it's great to have inno innovation, but how do we bring that innovation to implementation to our patients? It's a long road. Many, for example, uh, chemotherapy drugs often spend 20 years either in the lab or in research before it actually gets to patients. And part of that route, part of that critical route, um, instead of just giving uh, patients new discoveries, is making sure that those discoveries will actually benefit patients. And that's where clinical trials come in. And participating in clinical trials is one very important part um, of our team and how it functions. What is a clinical trial? Well, the WHO or the World Health Organization tells us that a clinical trial is a research study. It involves people and it involves health-related interventions and how we evaluate how those interventions affect the health outcomes of the people involved in the study. And these studies may include medications or drugs, um, for example, cancer-treating drugs, biological products, surgical procedures, as well as devices, behavioral treatments, process of care changes, and also preventative care, etc. Now, when we think about clinical trials, clinical trials just don't happen like that. What happens is clinical trials happen because we're part of a very broad ecosystem, an ecosystem that includes partners both internationally, nationally, as well as on a local level. And we're talking about organizations of people, specialists in gynecologic oncology, for example. It includes um, uh, various hospital settings. It includes the pharmaceutical industry as well, very frequently, um, as well as support for those studies. Support from those studies sometimes may come from pharmaceutical com companies or companies that manufactures uh, the new devices, but they also can come from other sources. And we have been very privileged to uh, work with different sources, um, one of which is the Jewish General Hospital Foundation, as well as uh, Gloria's Girls. So what I'm also going to tell you about is when we talk about clinical trials, do patients just have a clinical trial or participate in a clinical trial because it exists? Actually, no. Our team works together. And very frequently, before patients ever embark on a clinical trial, we have team meetings. We have tumor board meetings that include numerous specialists, not only from gynecologic oncology, but from radiation oncology, from medical oncology. They include our social workers. They include our holistic healers that are part of the team. They include genetics. They include um, our daily um, functioning team, including our fellows, our residents um, as well. They include our nurses. And not only do those meetings happen locally at the Jewish General Hospital, but we collaborate with other hospitals. So that on a weekly basis, for example, we collaborate and have these same meetings with the MUHC. We also have um, meetings that are Montreal-wide, meaning we recruit the brain power of other institutions like the SHUM like Charles, Charles Lemoyne, um, as well as uh, Maisonneuve-Rosemont. So when our patients are offered a clinical trial, it's because we've discussed their situation. And we understand that traditional therapies may not be the best option for them. And clinical trials, um, on the other hand, may be. Over the years, over the last 13 years, we've had the privilege of having uh, been a part of various clinical trials, as you're going to see here. So in, because of time, I'm not going to tell you about every single one of these clinical trials. But when we talk about clinical trials and research, this is the image that people usually have in their mind. 
oftentimes people will say, and even our patients will say, you know, I don't want to be guinea pig. I don't want to be a hamster. I don't want to be experimented on. But tonight, I'm going to challenge that notion. And I'm going to ask you if any of these women up here, whether they look like guinea pigs. Because these are real women. These are real women who undergone clinical trials. The first two women that you see um, have undergone robotic surgery, okay? And what I'm going to explain to you a little bit about is the history of robotic surgery in Canada. The first robot in Canada was acquired by the University of Western Ontario in 2006. Unfortunately for them, that particular robot wasn't housed in the op in the hospital that they usually operate in. And unfortunately, they weren't able to really take up that technology and really offer it to their patients. But thanks to generous donors and the Jewish General Hospital Foundation, in 2007, um, in November 2007, we acquired our first Da Vinci robot. December 17, 2007 was that seminal date when our team performed the first robotic surgery for a patient with gynecological cancer. Now, since that time, we've been able, we've had over a thousand women benefit from that technology. And if we look at how the rest of Canada um, has fared, you'll see that University of Toronto acquired the robots in 2008, followed by Alberta and British Columbia. Thereafter, there was uh, the MUHC, or the Montreal General Hospital, who acquired their robot in 2010. In 2011, it was um, uh, Ottawa Civic Hospital. And in 2012, was University of Montreal at St. Luke. And finally, the most recent team uh, who acquired a robot to perform gynecological uh, oncology surgery was in Laval in 2013. And because we had very enthusiastic um, people behind us, including uh, very enthusiastic women who wanted to have access to this technology, our team really thrived. And we generate a lot of the data that informs um, how women can be treated with this robotic surgery. And in fact, when you look at this particular map, we're proud to say that Almost every team that performs uh, gynecologic oncology surgery with the robot has been trained by a member of our team. Let me give you another example of how our team works in clinical research. Well, this is the DignicAP. As you can see here on the left side, there is a very funny looking machine. What this machine does is it actually delivers coolant to a patient's scalp so that during the time of chemotherapy, their scalp can be cooled to a point where they may end up losing much less hair from otherwise alopecia-inducing chemotherapy, meaning women who would otherwise lose all of their hair may actually be able to keep some of their hair. Now, how did this project come about? This project actually came about from one of our patients. And when she had undergone chemotherapy that would cause her to lose her hair, she actually used something called a cold cap, which is of a similar principle, but requires dry ice. Okay, so she very diligently used to stuff this cap with dry ice and put it on her head before chemotherapy, during chemotherapy, and at home. And one day when she was transporting that dry ice in her car, it started to rain. So what did she do? She rolled up her windows, right? Because she didn't want to get wet. Unfortunately, the fumes from that dry ice, that carbon dioxide that she was carrying, caused her to become very dizzy and caused something that we know as CO2 or carbon dioxide intoxication. She pulled over her car, and as soon as she opened the door, she collapsed. And luckily, somebody found her and brought her to the hospital. And she spent some time in the cardiac care unit here at the Jewish General Hospital because of a transient cardiomyopathy induced from that CO2 intoxication. And that patient said, no one should have to 
go through that in order to try to prevent something so simple as losing all their hair. And as a result, both her and her family brought this particular um, technology to our attention. And with the help of Gloria's Girls, um, who actually funds the project, and Sphinx Medical, who allows us to rent the machine, we're actually conducting a clinical trial to see, if, to see really whether or not this particular technology can help our patients lose less hair when they're having certain types of chemotherapy. I'm going to bring it back to these women. Okay, we've talked about the first two women who benefited uh, from robotic surgery. Now I'm going to bring you to this photo. This last patient here and her sister in green came to us about seven years ago. And her story is that she had ovarian cancer. She had surgery at another hospital. She had her first line chemotherapy, but unfortunately the disease came back. And after trying to fight that disease with different types of chemotherapy, which wasn't working, she came to our center. She came to our center sort of as a last ditch effort to see if we had anything else to offer her. And it just so happened that one of the studies that you saw flash up before, we had a study for her. And it was a drug called AZD2281. And this particular lady here, has been taking AZD2281 for the past seven years. She cycles, she skis, and she even hunts moose in the winter. AZD2281 is now called Olaparib. It's a PARP inhibitor, or it's called Limparza. And only recently, in the last week, has it undergone um, has it actually been uh, brought to the attention of Health Canada for approval for marketing for ovarian cancer patients. But this lady has had this for the past seven years. And I can tell you, had she had to wait seven years, you definitely wouldn't see her here smiling. So these women are not guinea pigs. These are real women accessing state-of-the-art technology and therapy. These are women who are playing an active role in their healthcare. They're accessing these new treatments, and they are helping others by contributing to that medical research. Thank you. <laughs>